That's an unimaginably small number. What we have is 0 0.0034567891. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, six, six, three. That's Planck's constant. And what I'm leaving off are a load of other decimals, a load of other numbers here. We've just rounded that that up slightly. H conjures up quantum mechanics, and it's the constant of Planck that tells us that this is the uh, smallest amount of action that we have. Now action is actually quite a diff difficult concept. Planck's constant is really, it's a measure of, of quantization. It's something that comes up in quantum mechanics. And it's to do with the fact that things in, in the world, when you look on a small enough scale, when you look closely enough, you find actually they don't vary smoothly, they don't vary continuously. They take on sort of discrete values. And so for example, the energy of light given out by an atom it doesn't give out light at all frequencies, it gives out light at very particular frequencies. And those frequencies tend to be very close together, uh, but actually there's only particular values of, of, of energy that you can give out. And Planck's constant is really what dict dictates how close together those values are. Planck's constant tells us about how electrons orbit atoms. Um, I've wondered about H and I've wondered about the physical significance of H. I've never quite wondered why H, why it's called H and not W or Z. Huh. Again, I ought to know it's a similar question to C. I, I, um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I know why it's not called P because P is conventionally used for momentum and one of the key equations relating um, uh, momentum and wavelength is this, so we couldn't call Planck P as well. So Planck was a, a very famous German physicist considered by many to be the, the, the sort of godfather, the forefather of, of um, quantum mechanics. Do you rate him? Oh yes, yeah, I don't think there's a physicist alive, dead, or to come that wouldn't rate Planck. So this is a second year undergraduate experiment that is actually used to measure, to work out what Planck's constant is. We have a mercury lamp here, so we have this of a lamp which is filled with uh, mercury gas and we're actually putting um, electricity through that to generate, to excite the atoms, excite the electrons in those atoms and those electrons bounce between different states and they give off light. And so that's what we can see here is we can see the light coming out from the mercury uh, lamp. And then we've got a series of, of lenses and um, slits to really um, control how that, where that light goes. So over here we've got a prism which splits that light up into its constituent colours. Now unlike sunlight where you know if you take a prism and you split that up you see a broad, broad spectrum, here what we have are very well defined lines. This is a, in effect a signature or fingerprint of mercury. Then what we do is we take those spectral lines I'm going to have to move this. Take the, we take those spectral lines, and what we have here, uh, it would have been helpful if I'd set it up. Do you, can you just... You can just edit this, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here we've, with the prism, we've broken up the light into its constituent colours. We really want to focus um, on one of those colours now and so let's, we're going to select the green, we've got a slit here which selects the green out, we've got a lens back here which in turn focuses the light onto this photodiode. So we have green light, we have photons with a particular energy coming into this photodiode and what's inside this photodiode is a metal. And the green light comes in, it releases electrons and from looking at the energy of those electrons we can work out what Planck's constant is. That looks like Ned Kelly, that diode. Do you know who Ned Kelly is? Uh, <laughs> I guess I never thought of it in quite that sense, yeah. So H is equal to 6.63 by 10 to the minus 34. And my f the first year on any undergraduate would kill me if I didn't add the unit, so dual second. Now, the reason that it appears small to us is that we are very large objects. Um, you know, we weigh 80 kilos, whereas atoms are something like uh, 10 to the minus 27 kilos, that's the mass of the proton, the electron is even lighter. And down at that scale, the, the, the units that we choose to express H in uh, become a little bit cumbersome and inconvenient. So if we were working out these things on atomic scales, then uh, H would have a much more convenient, convenient and easily, more easily memorable value.
so there's a really f um, fascinating story called, um, well, about a character called Mr. Tompkins, which was written by a guy, a physicist of another very important physicist called George Gamow, um, back as I believe in the 50s, um, 40s or 50s. And um, he, uh, Mr. Tompkins is a bank manager who goes along to various different um, talks um, by leading physicists and scientists of the time. And he sits through the lectures and invariably, halfway through the lectures, he, he falls asleep and he has a dream. And the dream is usually related to the topic of the lecture. And one of those very popular um, Mr. Tompkins stories relates to um, what would happen if H wasn't this imaginably small number? What if it was larger? And if it were larger and if it were large enough so that we could see the, the, these quantum phenomena in the, in the real world, and that would mean that instead of being sort of solid objects, we would have wave-like characteristics. So we would spread out. If I were to, for example, to walk through the door, because I'm now of wave-like characteristics, I would diffract. And so bits of me would go in different directions.